Holy Spirit, have your way. You know us name by name, situation by situation. And so, Father, it is with great confidence we believe that you'll tailor this message for those who hear today, those who watch by internet, those who will hear it in days to come by technology. And Father, in Jesus' name, be glorified. That is our prayer. And in the name of Jesus, we give you alone the praise, the glory, the honor, all the adoration for all that shall be accomplished, for all that should be revealed in Jesus' name. And the believers said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Please go with me, Bibles, to uh, Philippians, the third chapter, for our foundational text for tonight's lesson. We have been teaching uh, in a series of lessons on taking a stand. And so we want to just continue in that same thought on taking a stand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have our smiling exercise. Look at the person next to you. Smile real big. Show them your pearly whites, your 32s, your 22s, your 10s, whatever you have left or purchased. Amen. Let's raise our Bibles. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll just look there in verse 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, in, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're going to talk about taking a stand with my perseverance. Perkins, taking a stand with my perseverance. Paul talks about oppressing. And the Bible teaches us not to give up. Yet there are many people who are on the brink of giving up. Never before, I never, uh, I, I, like I have heard in times past, last several months, have I heard preachers wanting to give up. I've uh, had people wanting to give up. And uh, we have to understand that it's only when you choose to press, only when you choose to persevere, that you will lay hold on the promise of God. We are talking about the church in general, the people of God in general. We are in a faith fight like never before. And so if our God can help us in tough times, he's not worth, he's not much of a God. Amen. So we cannot back off just because we don't know how God's going to bring things to pass. <clears throat> we have to hold fast to our confession of faith. We have to hold fast to our dreams and hold fast to those things that God uh, promised us when, in the time when times were good. And I'm here to tell you that if you will do that and settle once and for all, that you will not give up no matter what it looks like. See, those who saw the miracles we're willing to hold out until the end. <laughs> Amen. And so it, you are in miracle territory when you feel like giving up. <laughs> yeah, you, look person and say, I'm in miracle territory when the devil's trying to get me to quit. Amen. Amen. And so we just want to talk to you for just a few minutes on this persevering thing because, um, you know, people always ask me, do you, do you, did, did you ever feel like giving up? Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, did you ever threaten? I threatened to give. That's when, pre when preachers come to me. I don't judge them. I understand. I've been there. I've been there when the pressure was so hard on me and I couldn't see how I was going to make it. And uh, I was concerned about my reputation and what folk was going to say if I failed. So rather than hold on and fail, just quit, then I can go out with, you know, with, with my ego intact. <laughs> Even though I, I knew I couldn't quit, but I wanted to. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. You know, you've been standing in faith for something, and it just doesn't look like it's going to happen. Don't know how it's going to happen, but you know you got the word on it. 
You follow me? You've been doing all the confessions. You've been doing everything you're supposed to do. But it just doesn't look like it's going to come to pass. And you're almost, uh, you know, you're almost to the point where you're just saying, well, that's all right. I don't even want it. But you really do want it, you understand? You want to give it up, but then you still don't want to give it up, you understand? But you feel like if you give it up, at least the pressure's off of you, and you don't have to continue the fight. Do I have the right address for the mail tonight? Amen. But the scripture teaches us in, about perseverance, and that's what the lesson is about. The lesson tonight is about persevering because you are in miracle territory when you feel like giving up. God told me one time uh, when uh, you are tired, the devil is tired too. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, the Bible says, can a, can a spirit get tired? Yes. The Bible says when the devil, you know, when the demon is cast out, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. So if he's seeking rest, that must mean he must be tired. So if you are tired in your fight, you must understand you have now arrived in miracle territory. Amen, amen. <laughs> and if you just don't quit, you'll see him come through. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen, amen. Put your ribbon here because we'll probably come back this way. But we have some teaching points. And we have some preaching points. Our teaching points will deal with the concept of perseverance being made clear in Scripture. The concept of persevering has been made clear in Scripture. Second teaching point will be the cultivation of perseverance is critical. It is critical to your success. And then the final point, which we may, may be a preaching point, will be the celebration of perseverance is contagious. Everybody say contagious. Yes. All right. Now, so then go in your Bibles now to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Because if we're going to take a stand, we found out what taking a stand is all about. It's me representing God in the earth. It's me doing something significant. It's me taking a stand for righteousness. It's me stay, taking a stand with my faith. It's me taking a stand with my faithfulness. It's me taking a stand representing God in my generation. In order to do that, I cannot afford to quit. Too much is at stake. Amen. Years ago, with one of my mentors, uh, I, uh, I, called, I, came, I came to him and I told him, you know, uh, you know uh, it, was, it was tough for me. I had a little bit of church, didn't look like it was going to ever grow. And um, <laughs> don't judge me. All right. A <laughs> little bit of church, didn't look like it was going to ever grow. And uh, uh, money wasn't coming in. And uh, I was under a divine mandate. To be full time. I didn't want to be full time. I liked working because I liked making money. You know, working, making money, you know, didn't have to, you know, you had to depend on folk, church folk, you understand? And at that time I was in a traditional setting that had no revelational prosperity, and I really thought I was supposed to be, you know, without, even though I wanted. Okay, I had a good job. Everybody said good job. I had a good job paying me well. And then God calls me into full-time ministry. So now I'm making only $300, not before I'm making my good salary and the $300 the church was paying me a week. Now I'm just making the $300. That don't sound like that's fair. <laughs> but, but I know the voice of God and I was obeying God. Well, I got tired in that and uh, went through a church fight. They put me out. God, let me go back to work. No, you, no I'm telling you, 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 know, you meet full-time. And, uh, and so uh, I went to my mentor because I'd been crying on his shoulder. And, uh, um, and, uh, and this particular day, he just got tired of me crying. So I told him, I think I'm going to quit and go back to work. I think I'm going to just go back to work. I'm not going to quit the ministry. I'm going to go back to work and give me a job. And he said, well, here you go. That's what you ought to do. <laughs> Until you decide you're going to trust God. Because he got tired of me whining. I didn't want him to tell me that. I want. I, I needed. You know, I wouldn't need the shoulder to cry on. I, I need some sympathy. Okay, I'm gonna go over here, preach. I'll judge me over here. You know, sometimes you say something to folk, and you don't. You want them to just kind of chime in with you and, and join the pity party. Well, this day he was just fed up with me, and he said, "Hey, that's what you ought to do. Till you decide." And I just get straight. He was just straight with me. He said, "Until you decide you're gonna trust God, take your little tail back to work." Then he made me mad. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to work. You got it? 
because uh, I had a need that was, uh, and, and uh, the need was pressing. I didn't see how God was going to meet the need, so I needed to help him out. So I go to work, and I work, I go back to a computer company, go to work. I, um, the guy asked me to come in after work, and uh, that's not unusual in the computer field because many times their days are very texting and texting and trying. So I go in, and this guy pulls his Bible out. The guy who's interviewing me, he pulls his Bible out and begins to minister to me on trusting God. Because he said, I told him I was, because he asked me, well, why are you looking for a job? We come in on the phone. He said, why are you looking for a job? And why are you out of the industry? And I told him I was a pastor. And uh, he said, oh, you're a pastor, a pastor. He says, oh, well, come in after church. Come in after, after, after work, after hours. So he pulled his Bible out. Now, I'm, I didn't come here for no Bible lesson. <laughs> And he goes through the scripture to show me I should be trusting God for my livelihood and also for my wife not to work and be right there with me by my side. <laughs> he was a Baptist deacon in a, in a church. And uh, then he said, young man, I'm going to hire you. And every day I see you, I'm going to tell you you're out of God's will. All I want you to do is give me 40 hours a week. You can go to any funeral you need to do, go to. He said, I'll give you your project that you need to, uh, to, to, to I, was, uh, I was applied for a job for, as a computer programmer, uh, as a programmer. And so he said, I'll give you the work you need. He said, all I'm going to trust you, young man, that you give me a 40 hour week. But if you need to go and do some with your church business, you take care of it. But I'm going to tell you, every time I see you, I will remind you, you are out of God's will. And he did. <laughs> and his, his, uh, his office was right there by the coffee bar. So I kind of see if he was in the office. And if I didn't think he was in there, I'd go. And man, he'd somehow, somehow know that he was in there. And he'd holler, how does it feel to be out of God's will? <laughs> my computer skills were coming back. And I was, you know, all excited because my skills were coming back and, and I was writing and I'd take it to him and he'd look at it and check it and he'd say, you're still out of God's will. <laughs> so that went on for about, uh, oh, just about three months and um, until I just got so miserable. And uh, I went to him to, to give my notice and he said to me, he said, young man, you don't have to give any notice. He says, go and do a good job for God. And y'all hear me saying that all the time, don't you? I got it from that deacon. Do a good job for God. Made up my mind that day when I left there, I would never turn back. All right. Now tonight, I'm believing that you will settle once and for all. And you will never turn back from what God told you to do. Whether it's building a building, whether it's some sort of mission project or whatever it is, but you're not going to quit. That you're going to persevere. You're going to press. You're going to do whatever it takes. But one thing you're not going to ever do is you're not going to quit. Look at the person next to say, we're not going to quit. Come on, tell me. You're going to settle it once and for all that you're not going to give up. No matter how much pressure, no matter what it looks like, you're not going to quit. Are you there in Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and let's look at verse 3 because we're going to look at this concept in the scripture on persevering, that it's all through the Bible. So God didn't fool us. Uh, he, he's laid it out in the scripture, and it's crystal clear that you've got to press if you're going to be successful. Now, have I had some difficult days since that day? Of course I have. Amen. And really, the thing that I, I needed, the money that I needed, when I, when I got started to work, you know, it was at a pay period, and they held two weeks in the hole. <laughs> I still had to trust God. <laughs> All right, now, look at verse, verse 3. It says, for a dream coming through a multitude of business. Amplified says this of part A, a dream cometh with much business and painful effort. Painful effort. Painstaking effort. So the Bible is clear, and it doesn't fool us to make us think that things are going to be easy. 
Well, but, but wait a minute, preacher. Doesn't the Bible say his yoke is easy? Yes, but that word, that phrase, as it's translated, has nothing to do with effort. It says the yoke fits. So whatever God has for you to do, it fits you. But it has nothing to do with effort because we can see a whole lot of effort, painstaking effort in the lives of the saints. So if that scripture is true, a whole lot of folk missed it. Amen. But when Jesus says his yoke is easy, my yoke is easy, he's saying my assignment for you fits you. It may not fit anybody else, but it'll fit you. It's easy. It fits you. Amen, amen, amen. Go, go in your Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. It is scripturally established that I've got to get my mind set, that I've got to press. I've got to press. So people talk about you being an overnight success. It's a long night. Amen. Everybody want a quick work. But what if it die quick as you think it's going to be? Amen, amen. So the Bible is clear. Verse 35 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of war, or great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience. Now that word patience is endurance, same as perseverance. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. It is a fact that you can be in God's will and the manifestation has not yet come. Just because the manifestation has not yet come does not necessarily mean you are outside of the will of God. Because the scripture here says, after you've done the will of God. So it's talking about somebody who has done the will of God, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's, but there is a time of waiting. There's a time of endurance. There's a time of pressing. There is perseverance that is required to receive. Look at the person next and say, you have missed it. Come on, tell them, you have missed it. You just need to persevere. Come on, tell them, you need to persevere. Help me preach to them tonight. I'm going to show you in a minute why you need to do that, why you need to help me preach to them. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you haven't missed it. You, you just need to persevere. You need to hang in there. Yes. 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 Amen, amen, amen. Now, um, um, uh, you know, the body of Christ, well, body of Christ ha has gone through a, a season of training, and, and, we're, and um, that season of training is like spring training uh, for, for, an ath for the athlete. In spring training, you get to understand fundamentals. But it's game time now. So there's a different attitude we got to have in game time. I got any athletes in the house, those who played organized ball, and I'm talking about those who you know, play ball on the street, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about some organized ball where you had to go to spring training and that sort of thing. And in spring training, they take you back through all the fundamentals and that sort of thing. You all understand that, you understand? But when, on game day, the coach got a different attitude. Because you've been given an assignment. If it's football and you're supposed to hit the man, he's wondering why you didn't hit the man. He ain't talking to you real nice about the fundamentals. You know the fundamentals. You've been through the training. Now hit your man. Are oh, you listening to me? If it's basketball and you're supposed to set your pick so that the shooter on the team can be open and you're not setting your pick, he wants to know what's wrong with you. You need to set the pick. The game depends on you setting the pick. The shot depends on you. He ain't up here in the federal fund fundamental. It's not about fundamental. I'm telling you now, game is on. You got your Bibles all colored up. You've been to all kind of Bible schools. Four and five translations of the Bible. Game is on. It's not time to quit, but it's time to perform. It's time to persevere. It's time for us to put all we have learned, I'm getting too excited, into action. It's good. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go with your Bibles to uh, uh, Hebrews while we're there. Let's go to chapter 6. And let's see if we can't see in Scripture with crystal clarity that God's telling us that perseverance, endurance, is a part of this. Amen. So there in verse, uh, 
Verse 12 says, um, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Everybody say faith, faith. and endurance. endurance. Faith, faith and perseverance. perseverance. I'm just showing you it's all through the Bible. So we got to get rid of that nursery rhyme stuff that we learn. Got to get rid, rid of all of that, all that, you know, you know, happily ever after everything is settled in 30, in 30 minutes sitcom. And that ain't, that ain't life. Real life is you've got to put forth effort. Real life is you've got to want it. You've got to want it enough to stare the devil down and every hindrance down and declare no matter what happens, you're not going to quit. And the one who promised must come through. Can I get a better witness than that? <laughs> Amen. All right, watch this. It says, verse uh, 13, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Uh, so after, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Everybody say after. So I got I to get this in my head. You know, uh, that, that, that this, this may not be as quick as I want it to be. Abraham stood in faith for almost 25 years for the promise. Can't get you to stand 25 days. Amen, amen. So tough times don't bother you because it's a part of the game. It's a part of what we go through. Are y'all listening to me? All right, now watch this. Watch this. Let's, let, me, let me move on. All right. Now, so then, I look at examples in the Bible of people who had to press their way. The four men who brought their uh, uh, friend to Jesus, they got to the door, and there was a crowd at the door. They could have easily said, can't go any further. And we tried to get you here, but we couldn't get to it. So uh, we're going we're to we're we're take you on back home, and you better not start to cut up because we'll leave you right here. But they decided to put forth extra effort. Climbed up on the roof, tore the roof off, lowered him down in front of Jesus. And the Bible says, and when he, Jesus, saw their faith, when he saw their effort, when he saw they wasn't going to quit, when he saw that they had what it took, when he saw their perseverance. I'm, I'm telling you, you are on trial now. God's looking at you. Yeah. Do you really want it bad enough? Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, my kids, you know, my kids, they, 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 they have this thing, you know, because I, I, I tell them sometimes, I say, you know, but, you know, I, I, don't have, I, I, need, to, I need to get into the Word. I need to study. Give me some, you know. Anyway, it's, oh, Dad, just so well, you, you, you're going to do it. I mean, that's how they treat it. You, go, you got it. Got it. Now, see, I, I'm, 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 I'm careful on that because, see, I don't want them to think that what you see me up doing in here is easy. Just don't come <laughs> by me reading one scripture right before I come in here. There are hours of study that goes in. There are hours of prayer that go in so I can hear his voice up here when I'm talking so that I deliver the right mail at the right time to the right person because so much is riding on what's going on here. Major League Baseball players can have a 300 batting average and be considered a champion. That means they can be at the bat and miss the ball. <laughs> what? Seven out of... Seven, seven out of ten times. They can miss it. We can't afford that as preachers. We can't afford, we can't afford a 300 batting average. Every time we stand here, somebody's life is on the line. Somebody's eternity on the line. We cannot afford that kind of batting average. We got to bat up in the thigh. We got to hit the ball every time. And that comes with effort. Are oh, you listening to me? It comes with effort. And see, you've got to get into you that, hey, if you are going to develop the gifting that's in you so that you maximize your potential, it comes with effort. 
Don't try to take the cheap way, the route, the cheap way out. Oh, you listen to me. My uh, friend now, he uh, coaches the Nets. And uh, uh, he was telling me years ago, I was talking about a particular ball player, and he was saying that this ball player, you know, he couldn't really find a team. He had a, had a famous daddy who played ball, but he couldn't really find a team. And so I asked him the question, what's wrong with this guy? Why? He says, well, Hilliard, he's got, he's got good skills, but he's not good at any one thing. And because he's not good at any one thing, he's not really a good utility player. But see, he says, and, and, and I'm telling you, this Avery Johnson, you know, Avery's not that tall. But he was, I mean, he led in assists and all that kind of stuff. He says, he says, I specialize in getting the ball to the man who's going to make the basket. He said, that's why I always had a place because when they wanted a, a player to get the ball to their key man, I was the one they wanted. I'm telling you, you've got to decide you're going to be great at one thing. Quit trying to be a jack of all and decide you're going to master one thing. So that when somebody needs that one thing, you're the one that's going to come up. Everybody say one thing, one thing. We have great admiration for uh, the woman with the issue of blood. She may be our preaching point. And that is because she had to press her way through the crowd. Great admiration for Joseph because after all of the years of being tried and all of the years of setbacks, he persevered, end up in the palace. We have great admiration for Joshua and Caleb because they were the only ones who had the positive confession and the, and the confession that the promised land can be ours. And with two million other voices against them, their voices prevailed in the end. Everybody said that's the power of confession. Yeah, they had, they had two million other folk confessing negatively and against them, but because of the power of confession, their confession prevailed. Your confession has power. Don't ever back off of what God told you. Don't ever back off your confession. No matter how it looks, you've got to stay with your confession. Amen, amen. Well, there are some satanic elements that poison my perseverance. Number one, my perseverance is poisoned by painful persecution when I lend my ear to what people say. My, pers my perseverance is poisoned by many times my personal perversions. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Stuff I've been wrestling with I haven't been able to get free from. Come on, you might get quiet on now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to get quiet on now. You can't say a man too loud on that. Everybody look, look, look down your road like, whoa. <laughs> now, Your perversion ought to bother you. Yes. Uh -huh. right. Right. The weakness that you're wrestling with ought to bother you. The day you come comfortable with it is the day that you open your, door, your life to be controlled by the devil. Now, you know, we hear people, I came to Jesus as I was. We have all come, came as we were, as, as we were. But we I shouldn't stay that way. You got to stay with living holy, the blood of Jesus, and all of that until you get free. And many times folk quit in the process because they are struggling with their own private, personal perversion. Many people quit. Their perversion, their perseverance is poison because of plaguing problems. If it's not one thing, Come on now, if it's not one thing, you know, I mean, I mean, I know what it is to go from problem to problem. Look like once you get this, something, something else come over here. Get this, something else coming up with. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that almost make you just want to quit. Everybody say, but it's not going to always be like that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Another thing that poison my perseverance caused me to quit is passive people that I got to deal with. You all excited about your vision, and you're gonna leave here, and you're gonna go home. You all excited, and then the thing, then they're gonna sing one of those dry songs, and the ushers gonna walk around like they ain't got no business. And you all ready to take the world, take the city, bless God, bless God. And you're gonna preach your best sermon, and they sit there and go. Come on, 
if you don't watch it, you will let passive people poison your perseverance. Amen, amen, amen. And then plummeting provisions <laughs> can also poison your perseverance. The extreme lack of sufficiency where uh, you're, you're struggling day by day. I've been there. Know what it's like. It can weigh heavily on you. But it's not going to always be like that. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. And I know some of you are in a faith fight. I know some of you, you're going from Sunday to Sunday. Yes, sir. But he's faithful. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So then, Pastor, what do I do to cultivate perseverance so I can be strong so I won't quit? So I, I'm glad you asked that. First of all, that must be the resolve to persevere. That must be the resolve. Resolve has to do with the, de the de deliberate discipline effort that I put to achieve what God wants me to achieve, having the fortitude, even in difficult times, to do it. Everybody say discipline. Discipline is enforced obedience. I got to desire the will of God for my life, desire what he promised beyond my convenience. I must desire it beyond compromise and excuses. The devil's always ready to hand you that. I must desire it beyond camaraderie exhortation. First one was convenient effort. Second one was uh, compromise and excuses. The third one is camaraderie exhortation. Would you believe it? I'll tell you this. Not one preacher in my city, when I got ready to start this church and do what I'm doing now, not one preacher, not one of my friends, not one of them encouraged me. In fact, all of them told me it would not work. They begged me not to do it. I had not one preacher that supported me. If I had to have that support, I never would have taken the step. So I've got to tell you that maybe something God called you to do and nobody is around to push you. If your resolve is based on them pushing you, you will not make it. You got to know that you know that you know God told you to do it. So your resolve is beyond <laughs> camaraderie exhortation and your resolve must be above circumstantial or contradictory evidence <laughs> oh my god oh my god because see we like to judge things by how they look whether or not god's blessing it oh my. it doesn't matter how it looks if that's what god says then that's what i got to do because there's always a season of contradiction when I'm on my way to what, to what God promised me. Jesus, the Bible says, endured contradiction. Contradiction is when my circumstances don't line up with this word I'm preaching. I'm preaching prosperity, but I'm making it week to week. <laughs> I'm preaching health and healing, and I'm dealing with a sickness in my own body. I'm preaching deliverance and I'm preaching peace and, and I'm, I'm all distressed and almost depressed myself. Everybody say contradiction. You got to hold on and have a resolve through contradiction. We all face times of contradictions. Amen. See, it's amazing sometimes you hear the, the testimonies of the guys who made it and they almost like you're missing God. Because when they finish their testimony, they make it so flowery because they don't tell the real truth. Then you almost, you almost wonder, well, what's wrong with me? When the real truth, if you take them to the side and talk to them and start asking the probing questions, they'll tell you there were times when they felt like giving up. Everybody say, I'm going to hold on. Through contradictions. I'm going to hold on. If no friend tells me I can make it. I'm going to hold on. Even if it's inconvenient. Hallelujah. 
So now let's deal with the regiment for perseverance. What do I have to do, preacher, so that I can develop the, and cultivate this, this no-quit attitude? Number one, I must establish, I must be established and settled in the Word of God. I must be, the Word of God must become the final authority for my life. The Word of God must be the final authority for my life. Number two, I must be excited about His sovereign will for my life, even if nobody else is excited. Amen, amen. No, no, serious. You know, we, we, we preach the sermon, David encouraged himself. You have to learn how to do that. No, no, you have to get excited. Well, how can I do that? You got to learn to visit your future on the canvas of your imagination. Got to understand, when I'm building this church now, when I'm building this, this ministry, and nobody in the city is saying it's possible. When I first started talk, talking about multiple campuses, they threw rocks at me. They said that boy's out of his mind. Have you ever heard anything like that? A church with multiple locations. I heard God. Later, they heard the echo. And what I've learned to do with those who persecute me and throw rocks at me, I refuse to waste my time to pick up a rock and throw it back. You throw a rock at me, I'll take the rock and build a bridge and a road because eventually you will be following me. You got to get excited all by yourself about what God promised he's going to do for you. Are you listening to me? I mean, you got to get excited. I mean, I got so excited. I had me a little TV light. Wait a minute, TV lights. They were uh, those, guard, those garden spotlights. That's all I could afford. I put them little garden spotlights up in my church because I'm going on TV. I'm as happy as I could be. You know, that's all I got. I don't think we even had a camera. And I think one brother had a camera. We borrowed every now and then. But other than that, you come to church, you see the lights, but ain't no camera. There ain't no camera in here. But I'm up here, I'm enjoying because look, I'm going on television. God told me I'm going to take the gospel around the world by way of television. If ain't nobody happy, I'm happy myself. And I wouldn't let anybody steal my joy. A preacher came one time at 3 o'clock, we, we had a 3 o'clock program. This preacher came, he saw my lights and go, what is all these lights doing up here? And my, my, my church, I had him trained, we all confessed. We're going on television. We're taking the gospel around the world by way of television. And he stopped, and he just bust out laughing. Oh, <laughs> they think they're going on TV. He had his choir there. All oh, the choir all oh, laughed at me. I remember this lady on the organ, big old lady on the organ. She almost fell out the organ laughing. <laughs> I got up right behind him and confessed. God's called me to take the gospel around the world by television and looked at him and said, you keep going to bed and getting up and watching the TV and you will see me on that. He's not laughing at me now. Number three, I must eliminate satanic worries. Choose not to believe the evil report. Only choose to believe the good report. I must embrace speaking the word of God. I must release my faith with the words of my mouth no matter what it looks like. Number one, I must be established and settled in the word. Number two, I must be excited about his sovereign will for my life. Number three, I must eliminate satanic worries. Number four, I must embrace speaking the word. Number five, I must be engaged in spiritual work. In other words, I got to be engaged in spiritual work, either helping somebody else and, or because there's a reciprocal blessing that I'm going to get. I, I call it spiritual work or strategic work. See, I'm going to get a rebound blessing because I helped you out. So you got to find somebody else to help out. Because what you make happen for, come on, God will make happen. Now we preach that, but are you involved? Are you, inv are you partnering with somebody else? Remember, David killed somebody else's giant and got promoted. That's the principle. Amen. Amen. So I'm not just going to be concerned about my giant, I'm concerned about your giant too. Because I know if I kill your giant, promotion is on the radar for me. Hallelujah. 
So number one, I must be established and settled in the word. Number two, I must be excited about the sovereign will of God for my life. Number three, I must eliminate satanic worries. Number four, I must embrace speaking the word. Number five, I must be engaged in strategic work. Number six, I must enjoy spiritual worship. Worship is the catalyst that moves the hand of God. And I'm not talking about coming to church worship. I'm talking about being able to worship by yourself. Amen, amen. And then number five, I must expect supernatural wonders to take place. I'm expecting the supernatural. My God, why are we, how, are, how has the church gone so far away where we, where we, we, can't, we don't expect the supernatural? Expect God to move supernaturally. Expect something out of the ordinary. What they say can't happen. When you get a no, no is only no for the day. My yes has got to be out there somewhere. Are you listening to me? All right. And finally, let's deal with the resource of my, of my perseverance. We dealt, number one, with the resolve. I found out that I have to desire it above convenient effort. I must desire it above compromise and excuses. I must desire it above camaraderie exhortation. I must desire it above circumstantial or contradictory evidence. The regiment for perseverance. We said I must be settled in the word of God. Number two, I must be excited about the sovereign will of God. Number three, I must eliminate satanic worries. I'm not going to let the devil throw me off track. I'm not going to believe the evil report. I must embrace speaking the word of God. I call those things which be not as though they were. I must engage in strategic work. What I make happen for others, activate the reciprocal principle, reciprocal principle, and it rebounds back into my life. Amen. I must enjoy spiritual worship because worship is the catalyst that moves the hand of God into my life. Therefore, I'm expecting the supernatural wonders to take place. When I give my testimony, everybody will know it had to be the Lord. Amen. But now, where do I draw the strength so that I persevere? Where do I draw the strength so that I persevere? Number one, my strength for perseverance is in the degree of reverence I have toward God. How big is God really to me? How much respect do I really have for God? Do you know that Jesus thought about quitting? Yeah. Come on. All right. No, no. Don't you be talking about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now. Yeah, yeah. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, felt like quitting. Offered his proposition to God. He said, let this cup pass. Because in the garden, the flesh rose up. And his flesh did not want to go through the suffering. And his flesh said, he said, Lord, is there another way? Can this cup pass? Then he goes and says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He got past the moment. But the point is, he had to face the moment. That doesn't mean he committed sin, but the Bible says he was in all points tempted like we are. So anything you're going through, Jesus went through it. So if we look and find out how did he make it through, now I get a template for how I'm going to make it through. Amen. And he goes, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now what he's saying here is, God, your will trumps my will. You've got to settle that God's will trumps your will. You've been bought with, y'all know this, y'all preachers, y'all know this. You've been bought with a price. You no longer have the option to do what you want to do. You have forfeited the right to do what you want to do because you have made him your Lord. You've just got to settle that thing. It's I am not my own. Perseverance. Strength of what comes in the continuous flow of information. If I get a continuous flow of information, well, that's a practical principle. You know, the reason people stay with diets is because they go to su the support classes. The reason the folks stay off of drugs is because they go to the support. support classes. So you got to have a support class. Welcome to your support class. Support class. <laughs> you got to have a continuous flow. So that means you got to take some information from a support class home so you can listen to it all the time. Because it's the continuous flow of information that strengthens your resolve. Number three, I must have a regiment of, a regiment of righteousness in my life. In other words, I've got to establish some, some do's and some, don't, some, not, some not to do's. Some never agains and some from now on. Anything that pulled you away from the straight and narrow, the, 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 the focus of your vision, you've got to understand you've got to leave that alone. 
See, there are some things I don't do. Why? I know I don't handle them well. I cannot get engaged in playing chess because I am very competitive, and that's bad for me. I'll be playing chess, I ought to be praying and stuff. <laughs> my, I, 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 I can't deal with that. I know how to possess my vessel. Are y'all listening to me now? Don't judge me if you want to, but that's, something, that's why I don't get involved with golf because I'm, I'm, I'm a very hot competitor. I get involved, involved in golf, I probably need to be a, a praying somewhere, preparing to preach somewhere, and I'm out there trying to work on my score. There's some things I know I can't do, so I stay away from those things. You got to know how to possess your vessel so you stay focused. Amen. So things that will distract you, then you've got to make sure that you put a regiment in your life to protect you from them. Amen, amen. Don't trust your flesh. Give me time to talk to my preachers right now. Don't trust your flesh. You can't handle it. You got to put safeguards in your life so that you can limit the temptation. Do I need to go through the guy no deeper? Do you need to go deeper? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you gotta make you gotta make it difficult for women to get to you, men. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm just about ready to get to my preaching point. Go with the Bibles to March. Mark chapter 5 and rest there. The strength of my perseverance is in the quality of my spiritual relationships. Are y'all getting these down? The degree of reference I have toward God. How big is God in my life? The continuous flow of information. The regimen of righteousness in my life. And the quality of my spiritual relationships. I got to have righteous focused folk around me. You got to survey those people who are around you. Those preacher friends you have. What are they all about? When you're around them, what are they talking about? Are they talking about women in, them church, in their church, men in their church? What are they talking about? Are they focused on scripture? Is there any spiritual revelation coming forward when you're talking? Is there any spiritual refreshing that you get? I need, I need somebody around me that when we talk about the word, my spirit leaps on the inside of me. Are you listening to me? You know, I got sons and I call and we talk and we're talking, we're talking about the word, you understand? My spirit leaps on the inside of me. I give them revelation that I have and it's a wonderful exchange. It ain't just, how is the weather over there? What y'all doing over there? No, 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 no. My time is too valuable for, the, for that. You got to surround yourself with people who will push you toward your destiny. And help keep your focus. Are you listening to me? So you got to look at your friends now. Look at the people who are around you. There's some things, that, some friends, you're going to have to redefine those relationships. Because if all they're doing is whining and crying about how bad it is, and they're not helping you in faith and speaking faith into your life, they, are, they will be a detriment to you and not an asset. Need somebody to remind me that he's my heal. I need somebody to remind me that he supplies all my needs. I need somebody to remind me he's a supernatural God. I need somebody to remind me he makes a way out of no way. I need somebody to remind me that if I trust him, he will provide. I need somebody to remind. Are you listening to me? I don't need nobody to tell me about the game. If I want to know the game, I can look at the game myself. I need some people around me who are spiritually focused. Somebody around me who's praying for me. Somebody around me who's lifting me up. Somebody around me who's keeping me focused on the call on my life. Yeah. Strength for my perseverance comes in the confidence that I have in the process. Everybody say confidence in the process. Now, I told you to go to Mark chapter 5, but back up to about chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to show you this. We're in good time, and I'll be able to use, just, just use my time. Watch this now. Everybody say the process. Oh, my God. Watch this. Watch this. Verse 26 says, and so he says, so is the kingdom of God as if a man cast seed into the ground and should rise and sleep night and day, and should sleep and rise night and day. The seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Now, what, this, everybody say this is the process. See, the process of the kingdom of God is when I first start, I don't know how. I don't know how. I'm not supposed to know how. Come on, come on. He gives me information on a need to know basis. When I need to know, that's when I'm 
going to know. I got to rest in that and go through the open door that I have. If I say it's the process. I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm see, because you cannot see the door of your house right now. Not physically, but if you keep going through open doors, you will eventually see the door of your house. I'm telling you, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 there, that from natural things, we can get insight into spiritual things. When I go through the open spiritual door that God has given me, I'm going to be able to see the next door. And when I go through that door, I'll see the next door. And when I go through that door, I'll see the next door. But I got to understand, when I start back here, I really don't know how God's going to pull it off. And it's okay. You don't have to stress yourself out. It is how the process works. And so I'm comfortable with the process that in the beginning, I don't know how. Hallelujah. That's shouting stuff there now. In the beginning, I don't know how. I'm not going to stress myself out. You ask me all the questions, I'm going to tell you. I don't know. All I know is what he told me the end going to look like. First, the blade. Everybody say pro progress is incremental. First, the blade. Then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. So listen, you believe in for your church to grow and you get one member Sunday. My God, it's time to shout. The blade. Are oh, you listening to me? No, no. All we got was one member of that. Come on, let's join us over the blade. So the strength for my perseverance comes through me understanding and having a degree of reference for God, continuous flow of information, regiment of righteousness in my life, quality relationships with others, other men and women of God, and the confidence that I have in the process. Now, my preaching point. The celebration of perseverance is contagious. Or you go to Mark chapter 5. Everybody say the celebration is contagious. And what I mean by that is when you hold out and you get your victory, God uses your testimony to help the next person who needs to hold out. Can I just talk y'all through this story? So I can... You all know the story of uh, the woman with the issue of blood? Y'all remember a girl who had the blood condition, pressed her way to the crowd, got healed, and then uh, uh, Jesus said, somebody touch me. Uh -oh. Then she came forward and he said, come on, give me your testimony. Yeah. It wasn't that Jesus needed the testimony. Jairus needed it. <laughs> no, no, Jairus was about to face a situation. Yeah. Well, he needed to know God could do something supernatural. He, his, he was going to have to persevere because right after she finished her testimony, then somebody comes up and says, they are Jairus, don't trouble the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. Jesus turns to her, him right away and says, oh, no, no, don't you give up your faith. Don't you panic. Don't you give up. Keep on believing. Y'all ready for my preaching points? Preaching point number one, she had a hemorrhaging situation. She had a situation that was getting worse and wasn't getting better. Some of you got hemorrhaging situations. In other words, it's something that will not correct itself. Number two, she had a history of suffering. Some of y'all have never seen a good day. Every day in your church has been a struggle. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Some of y'all have, have had a history of failing. You failed this, you failed that. You've never completed anything in your life. You have failed, gone from one failure to the next, and the devil is sitting on your shoulder saying you couldn't do this, and you didn't finish this, and you didn't finish that, and you didn't finish this. He's tormenting you by your past suffering. But she heard of the Savior. Watch this. In that she heard, meant that she was a candidate for breakthrough. Because in that she heard, faith came, which qualified her as a candidate for breakthrough. Watch this. So in that you are sitting in this place, hearing me teach this word tonight, means that you are a candidate for breakthrough. Look at the person next to you, I'm a candidate, I'm a candidate. 
yeah, yeah, I'm a candidate. I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm a candidate. God's getting this word to me. That's why I can't quit. I came in here thinking I was going to quit. I came in here contemplating quitting, but I can't quit now because God Taylor made a message for me, had me in the right place at the right time. Struggled to get here, but I needed to get here. I needed to qualify as a breakthrough candidate because I have heard the word. She knew that there was help for her sickness. Yeah. <laughs> she knew there was help for her sickness. She had heard of what Jesus had done. Oh, isn't that wonderful? When you hear testimonies of what he'd done. Oh, my God. Come on now. That's one good thing about coming here, you understand? You get to hear what God's doing in the lives of others. Because it stirs hope that if he yeah. did it for them, yes, he's going to do it for me. You understand? Yes, yes, yes. So because of what she heard, she understood that maybe nobody else could help her, but Jesus could. Yes, Everybody say, that's help, that's help. For, my situation. for my situation. Amen, 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 amen. So she had hope for her success. <laughs> her hope for her success we see in her testimony. She said, if I but touch the hem of his gun. I'll be made whole. Isn't that amazing? That she had, she said, everybody, she said, say she said it. No, no, she said it, so she's releasing faith that if I can touch the hem of his garments, I'm not going to go into all the history of all of that because i got to stay within my time. But I'm going to tell you, she understood that if I can touch it, if I can just touch it, if I can touch him, something's going to happen. She said it, 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 she said it. She said it, she said it, she said it. What are you saying? She said it. She, what are you saying? She said it, she said it, she said it, she said it. What are you saying? She said it. What you say matters. What are you saying about your church? What are you saying about your finances? What are you saying about your situation? She said it. She said it. She said it. She did not let hindrances stop her. She pressed her way. Come on, got to understand where she's going now. She's trying to get to Jesus. She is trying to make her way through the crowd, and the crowd won't let her through. But she pressed her way. Come on, look at somebody tell me, you got to press sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes to get what you want may not be handed to you on a silver platter, but the prize is worth pressing for. Uh -huh, amen, amen. When I look around, when I fly in my helicopter over my campuses, I'm glad I did not quit. I'm glad I pressed my way. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. When I fly to my home and I see it, I was just spread out and I look at all that God has blessed me with and I think I thought about walking off. I'm glad I pressed my way. Amen, amen. When I look and see of them, thousands and thousands of people who are being blessed, I'm glad I... Oh, my God. And then did y'all make me happy tonight? Oh, I'm so glad. Come on, look at the person next and say, press your way, press your way. Come on, tell them, God's got something good on the other side of your struggle. Yeah, God's got something good on the other side of your struggle. God's got something good on the other side of the hindrance. You've got to learn that if you're going to lay hold of what God has, you've got to... <laughs> she got healed supernaturally, which meant that she tapped into the power and it paid off. And then she had to tell her story. So as I close today, I'm going to just talk about a story that I always tell about why you cannot quit. Y'all remember my pump story? That was an old pump in the graveyard. And uh, we kids used to go and play with the pump. You had to take the water at the base of the pump and pour it in, and you had to start the process. And we had found out by experience that as you're working the process, it gets harder. And when it gets hard, you don't stop. You bear down. And I'm telling you tonight, some of y'all are in the bear down state. We found out 
from experience. That if you stop, you got to start all over again. So why stop? That's what happened to the disciples. When others walked off and Jesus turned to them and said, are you going to leave? They say, Master, to whom shall we go? They understood that, Master, we have put a whole lot in this already. How dare we walk off from our investment? How dare we walk off from all that we put in? I say that to you today. You put too much into this. Too much prayer has gone into this. <laughs> oh my God, my God. Too much time has gone into this. Too much sacrifice has gone into this. Look at the person next to you and say you can't quit now. If you quit now, you got to start all over. But if you just keep on pressing, if you just keep on working the process, soon and very soon, oh my God, cool, refreshing water will flow and then it's not much effort that's needed to keep the flow going. As I close tonight, I'm telling you, you can't quit. Why? Because Jesus didn't quit on us. When I needed him to die for my sins, thank God he didn't quit. On his way to Calvary, he didn't quit on me. When I needed him to die for the grace that I have, he didn't quit on me. When I needed him to die for the mercy I experienced, he didn't quit on me. So I'm telling you tonight, you have all of us have to decide that we're not going to quit on him. I've learned. Yes, I have. How to lean and depend on Jesus. I understand sometimes it may get a little rough. I'm not naive. I understand sometimes it does get a little tough. But I'm here tonight to tell you that I've learned how to lean and depend on Jesus. I found out if I trust him, he will provide. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. He will make a way out of no way. <laughs> he will pick you up, turn you around. Won't he do it? He will. I'm out of time. Don't you give up. Don't give up. Come on, look at the person next to you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for tonight. 